My name is Martha Seals. I'm a PhD student in social anthropology in New York University. Uh, and my paper discussed how empowerment projects related to cinema are being used in Brazil as powerful pedagogical tools to first develop critical thinking skills in indigenous young students and to foster the formation of a new generation of indigenous leadership, increasing agency, as you're mentioning, this is also a very strong topic in my discussion. Uh, second thing, to overcome cultural barriers. And the third thing, to surmount language barriers. So I'll we'll be talking about these three things. And I'll start just with a little bit of a context, a little bit of a, a history of uh, yeah, this empowerment project. So the first empowerment, pr the first empowerment project related to audiovisual production started in Brazil around mid, mid 80s. Uh, one of the first experiences was the Macaron Opoi Joy. It happened in 1985 with a Kayapó Indigenous Group. And another initiative, which is one of the most successful projects nowadays, Vision as Aldeias, uh, Video in the Villages, also started around this time, by 1987, with an Ambiquara group. But in common, they had the purpose first to provide audiovisual production equipment for the indigenous participants to use, second, to provide training in how to use them, and third, to provide the systems with edition and uh, uh, the addition of the audiovisual material recorded in order to enable the indigenous groups participating in the projects to elaborate their own representations of themselves. So, so these projects are what uh, Ginsburg and McDowell call particip participatory cinema. It's a collaborative approach to filmmaking which sought to create a more balanced relationship between the filmmakers and the groups depicted in the films. And the goal was to create a fair representation that included in its conception the interests of the groups portrayed. So, ultimately, they would in encourage indigenous groups to reject the stereotypes created by non-indigenous peoples about what it means to be indigenous and embrace the right to define one's own image to reformulate their own identity and to create their own space within society. Uh, and these initiatives would result in the development of indigenous activism through films. Uh, and this is particularly important because the representation of indigenous groups can be extremely negative. Uh, for example, in Mato Grosso do Sul, which is the state with the second largest indigenous population, the media depicts a very derog derogatory image of indigenous groups within the area. I, I uh, took some headlines of the Correio do Estado, which is one of the largest newspapers in Campo Grande to illustrate how derogatory this headline can be. So, for example, there's one saying, uh, Indians allegedly responsible for their problems of malnutrition. Um, and when in reality the problem is due to the monoculture of soybeans that dominate the region. So this is an interesting one. Another one, uh, Dourados Indian Village is one of the most violent places in the country. And this one is my favorite. No one uses arrow anymore and medicine men only want to drink. So these are the headlines in the main newspaper in Campo Grande. Uh, so there are four empowerment projects related to audiovisual production in Mato Grosso do Sul and especially to contest these negative representations, to raise the self-esteem of the young indigenous students and stimulate critical thinking, independence and leadership. Uh, you know, that's some hard. Just <laughs> This is particularly, particularly evident in examples such as the basic audiovisual production workshop for indigenous youth, which took place in 2008 during the first Brazilian Indian Video Festival, which was the first national festival focusing on Brazilian indigenous cinema. So uh, I went there and I attended the festival and followed the workshop as part of my master field research. Uh, and yeah, the workshop was organized by the coordinator of a museum, the Bosco Culture Museum, in collaboration with 
a Catholic university, Dom Bosco Catholic University, and this will be also interesting when we'll be talking about the second topic. Um, so something that I really found interesting is that above all the, the class dynamics of the workshops took to develop the student self-esteem. So for example, the coordinator, Sato, always sought to stimulate an active attitude among his students. Uh, and in addition to that, he was also trying to motivate them to transmit their newly acquired knowledge to others, so to, to foster this leadership, this agency. Uh, and I have here some codes that uh, illustrate well my point. So uh, I interviewed Sato and he expressed this perspective saying, uh, quote, these populations are in a very delicate moment. Over time, they went through an extermination process of their self seen here they learn that they can do things. Here they learn that they can do things. So this is the end of the book. Uh, and the effect on self-esteem is visible also in some of the statements of some of the students that I also talked to. So one student said, it's the first time I've ever held a camera. And I felt a little bit more important because I had the camera. The buttons seemed to be something monstrous, but today they became simple for me. So this is the end of the book. Uh, so in addition to this work on self-esteem, Sato also believed that the audiovisual workshop allowed for a more critical and ind independent attitude to confront society. So there's another quote that also illustrates as well. So he says, the purpose of the project is to provide a critical sociopolitical perspective. The project will not last forever, the workshop will end, the funds will run out, but what remains? The critical knowledge that will bring a new perspective to face society. Um, okay. So, this aim to stimulate this critical perspective to face society was <coughs> extremely evident also in a very interesting uh, event, event that happened. It was when Sato and other professors, and two of them were indigenous, questioned the frequent visits of journalism from different TVs and newspapers uh, from the region. So they invited the students then, then to invert this relationship. After the interviews made by the journalists, they would also interview them as they, were, uh, as they too were information producer, producers. Now indigenous people can film and create portrayals of indigenous groups. Why can the later also uh, film and create portrayals of the non-indigenous people? So, uh, and it was really interesting to see that because the journalists felt really uncomfortable with being interviewed. And they also tried to interview the cameraman and he escaped, he ran away. He didn't stand this experience. So it's really interesting to see when this inversion between this uh, position of subject, object, and this relationship the interview shifts, how it creates like, a difference, how it changes. Um, so another example also is Vincent Carelli, which is the founder of uh, the project Vision as Aldeias, Vision the Villages. And he also shared a similar view of the potential that audiovisual production workshops had to raise critical thinking, self-esteem, and empowerment and agency. Uh, as he said during the festival, indigenous groups have to prove they are able to do high quality work. And it was another thing that I found really interesting in the Vigio Nazaldeas project that uh, Carelli created a term to designate the indigenous filmmakers uh, which also reinforces this idea, uh, which is realizador indígena. And this term comes from the French uh, term realizateur, uh, which corresponds to director. But in Portuguese, and insert, inserted in the semantic field of interethnic inter relations in, in Brazil, it acquires a new meaning. It refers to someone that creates reality, produces, acts, someone that assumes an active posture in relation to society. Uh, so in this perspective, it really talks to the idea of empowerment through the camera and agency. It's also very strong, this idea of realizador indígena. Um, now, if empowerment projects related to audiovisual production have been used to develop self-esteem, critical thinking skills, and promote the empowerment of indigenous students that participate in this project, they also have been used to overcome cultural barriers in particular in the educational system and have been integrated to the pedagogical tools used inside some indigenous communities as well. And the film we're gonna see is about this particular part, but let me just talk a little bit before about the yeah. process in 
uh, academical institutions that are not indigenous. Um, so uh, audiovisual learning is deeply related to indigenous academic education, and we saw, for example, in the in the video in Brazil that uh, that the university, the Catholic University of Dom Bosco, was one of the partners. So uh, it's just like a, a, a sign that uh, how this uh, type of empowerment project is related to academic education. Uh, and every number, the, every year, the number of indigenous academic students raises, and the challenge is to find ways to make the academic education system more accessible to these uh, indigenous students. So on one hand, the search is crystallized in the formulation of pedag pedagogy courses directed to professors who attempt to adjust the forms of transmitting knowledge to indigenous students. And on the other hand, universities and educa educational institutions such as Dom Bosco Catholic University are developing projects to foster the learning of new technologies. Now, if indigenous, and this is, a, this is, I think, one of the interesting things in this work, if indigenous academic students in Mato Grosso do Sul have significant difficulties to interpret, interpret texts and to write, even in their own language, they demonstrate great easy in learning uh, to use new technologies like the internet and the video. So this is really interesting to see. Um, and the importance of audiovisual technology to abridge this gap between non-indigenous education institutions and indigenous students can be explained through the lens of Frederick Bard. Uh, according to Bard, in the societies without writing tradition, knowledge is transmitted first orally, second through visual presentation, and third through participation, participation in rituals. Uh, and, and the video allows these three forms of transmission. Uh, even in the case of participate transmission, because uh, the images deal with the emotions and catalyze representations built through the experiences. So it's seen as uh, an instrument that helps to reproduce social values in a way that is closer to traditional learning processes. Uh, therefore, it seems to be a more effective way than reading records, because it's uh, more expressive and more accessible. So in this perspective, the films are rapidly gaining popularity inside indigenous communities as well as a ped pedagogical tool, especially with the youth. Uh, so I'm going to show just two minutes of the video that I prepared for you. It's uh, from Visualize of Days and with the Yeshan Inca group, which is a group that lives in Acre, of the frontier of Peru. And I think it's really interesting to see how video is integrated into the community. Oh, there's no sound. Thank 
sino niya kay Padre Rudy Lodi at siya ka ayawin. Kimitanaw ang karo niya ka ang kilalo niya ka ang tawain sa Shpanglin. Kimitanaw kung bilo si Pahin ng Yopo ang aming dawon o si Shpanglin sa akang dati. Pagkain na matayang sa pagkain sa pagkain sa pagkain sa Mas puwani na ipat e pchok yan yung maipani Ipat e Ikat ay kami at sa ipang Jiri tayo ka pati puwaki Okay, so yeah, it's interesting because we see like the children watching the videos talking about like the wisdom of the ancestors, so we see how it's integrated. And another thing that I also find interesting is that the, the video is watched collectively and the image produced that is by, by one, like by, by the movie makers then like reiterated by all the community which promotes a continuity in the transmission of particular symbols from the culture. So this is also interesting. So video techniques can be a narrative support which allows for using a permanent representation of aspects of indigenous culture and social reality but public circulation, promoting the reproduction of these aspects of the culture in the, in the community itself. Now, if, the, if audiovisual production is starting to be used to overcome cultural barriers in the educational system and also to foster learning inside indigenous cultures, in indigenous communities, it also enables to surmount language barriers and to establish transnational connectivities and exchanges of knowledge, and here enters the connection between Brazil and Canada, and I'll be exploring this a little bit. So the showing of videos and exchange <coughs> of videos produced by different indigenous groups bring a new situation, the possibility to, became, to become acquainted with groups which are outside of the geographical and linguistic areas. Um, so, yeah, so here's a quote of ben Bentes. In the realm of discovering other people, the vi videographic image becomes an electronic window. Uh, the video record is a means of transportation which brings a person and his or her voice. Now, because the communication is not limited to oral language, the video, the video enables to surmount language barriers and to create identification and solidarity around common problems faced by indigenous groups from different countries, which have very different cultures, but similar histories in consequence of colonization and uh, of the marginalization that resulted from this inter-ethnic inter interaction. So how does the exchange of knowledge happen? Uh, so first, one of, one of the ways is through the participation of festivals. For example, in 2009, the second Brazilian Indian Video Festival had a guest exhibition with 12 films from Canadian indigenous movie makers from the Wapikoni Mobile. Uh, and, and Wapikani Mobile is kind of similar to Vision as Odeus, to the project Vision as Odeus. And they, they also had like five films from Bolivia, one film from Italy. Um, so, and, and one thing that it's also interesting in relation to Canada is that um, Canadian indigenous audiovisual productions are considered to be a reference for Brazilian indigenous filmmakers since indigenous films started much earlier in Canada. Uh, a second way is through the participation in audiovisual workshops in different countries. So, for example, uh, Brazilian indigenous movie makers from, from Mato Grosso do Sul participated in workshops in Cuba, in Bolivia, in the United States, so that promoted also this interaction and the exchange of material. Then there is also the exchange of videos uh, itself, so there is an ethical code by which the videos are sold, are sold to non-indigenous peoples but distributed free of charge to other indigenous peoples and to schools. So it's also promotes this interaction, this, this exchange. Uh, also through NGOs and empowerment projects that work with different indigenous groups, which is the case of Vision as Aldeias and also Wapikoni Mobile. Uh, and they facilitate the exchange of audiovisual material between the groups that participate in their projects. Uh, 
Um, uh, yeah, and so Webby Mobile uh, uh, in 2008 promoted with the Canadian Embassy uh, an encounter of an Anishinaabe Canadian movie maker who went to Brazil to attend a festival with the Equipank Indigenous groups from, from Xingu. And I'll show you uh, the film that was produced from this encounter by the Wishnabi uh, uh, movie maker. So, yeah, it's a five minutes clip. Yeah, we just have five minutes. Oh, yeah? Okay, I'm, I'm very end of the J'aimerais vous raconter mon voyage. D'abord, vue du ciel, un groupe d'Indiens. Des huttes de paille, une vague impression de retour dans le temps. sans hâte, sans bouteille. Un temps de culture et de pêche. Un temps d'enfant, de rire et de ressourcement. Ou un sait comme un scène. Ou un Indien est un Indien. Ou un humain est un humain. Ou je t'aime, moi, la petite sœur. Je n'étais pas dépaysé. Leur terre existait déjà quelque part en moi. J'étais profondément en paix. Au cœur de chacun, L'âme de la forêt. <coughs> Un pays de l'esprit vibrant, vivant. J'ai rencontré cet ailleurs qui nous ressemble tellement et j'ai envie de rallumer le plan, notre plan Anishnabé. Les 
libère en nous de nos blessures. Et elle prenons enfin notre nature. Nous sommes les enfants de deux mondes, un pied sur le béton, l'autre entre les herbes sauvages. Certains diront la bonne, rouge dehors, blanc dedans. Moi, je dis le fruit à ces murs aujourd'hui pour s'inventer un nouveau chemin à mon cassin. example of transnational connection around Brazil and Canada and the exchange of experiences and I find really interesting how to see this culture even though it's different triggers and hurdles proud of being Ashtonak so yeah it's really interesting how these connections uh, strengthen the uh, indigenous identity of each of the groups even though their cultures are so different. So there are other initiatives as well, like Boat Rouge Vive is another one, which works with, with Guarani indigenous groups, but I, I'm not entering the details because we are uh, short of time here. But yeah, so as a concluding remark, I uh, just, yeah, I would like to sum up a little bit and say that, yeah, audiovisual production don't serve only to teach audiovisual techniques, they, and it's seen as a pedagogical tool to foster critical thinking, self-esteem, empowerment, agency, and to mount cultural linguistic values. Uh, and it represents a tool in the, in the face of the dominant society uh, that indigenous groups have to define its relation with society and to control it, at least partially, uh, on its own terms. Thank you very much. <laughs>